Welcome to the Revenue Builders Podcast, a weekly show featuring B2B sales leaders and executives. Hosted by five-time CRO John McMahon and force management co-founder John Kaplan, the show goes behind the scenes with the people who have been there, done that, and seen the results. If you enjoy our content, please subscribe, rate, and review the show to help us reach more people. Revenue Builders is brought to you by Force Management. We help companies improve sales performance, executing the growth strategy at the point of sale. Find us at forcemanagement.com. Enjoy today's episode. Welcome to the Revenue Builders podcast. I'm John McMahon. I'm here with the co-founder of Force Management, the one and only John Cap. Kaplan. Cap, how are you, buddy? I'm doing good, brother. How are you? I'm okay. You can see at the top of my forehead, I got a couple couple stitches. We can talk about the other guys. I'm not going to make you go up. there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> we can talk about the other guys. The other time. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Cap, we're very lucky today to be joined by someone I consider a powerhouse in the sales world. Our guest today is an award-winning expert on selling to the top, top decision makers in accounts. Through Tony's deep insights on executive selling, he's helped millions, really millions of salespeople around the world blow out their sales goals. Tony Paranello is the author of the super, I don't know what other adjectives you put there, super duper best-selling book, Selling to Vito. The very important top officer, Cap. It's a book, you know, that I consider a classic in the sales world. Yeah. Since releasing Selling to Vito, Tony's created a sales training program focused on the mission critical components of executive level selling. He's been actively involved in speaking engagements to many of the top sales forces in the world. I think you remember we had Tony join us at one of our companies where he did an exceptional job training the sales force. Hey, in addition to his first best-selling book, Selling to Vito, Tony's also written other bestsellers. To name a few, Think and Sell Like a CEO, Stop Cold Calling Forever, Get the Second Appointment, How to Close Any Sale in Two Calls, Getting to Vito, Five Minutes with Vito, the Complete Idiot's Guide to Dynamic Selling, The Power of Will. And if that wasn't enough to keep Tony busy, he's also authored hundreds of magazine articles, hundreds of online blogs, and he's also the host of Club Vito, which is a weekly live internet broadcast. Hey, Cap, help me welcome the sales powerhouse, Tony Paranello. Tony, uh, it's great to see you again. We were talking in the pregame a little bit. The um, we Johnny had brought you in to uh, PTC years ago, and um, it had such a huge impact on uh, the sales organization. And I, we just love your message so much. So we're really, really thankful that you're here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, th- thanks for that introduction. I, you make me excited about listening to myself. Right <laughs> <laughs> hey, Tony, let's just jump right in for people that have never read your book. And I'm sure that some people are listening have read your book. But let's go back through and explain, first of all, who is Vito? And then why is it important for salespeople to get to Vito? Yeah, it's a good place to start. You know, the, the selling to Vito really has very little to do with my Italian heritage. You're trying to convince an Italian to do something that they don't want to do or sell to the mob or anything (laughs) with that. But it has everything to do with getting appointments and selling to these people I call veto who have the ultimate veto power over just about every decision of consequence that takes place in an organization. And they have titles. I mean, if you want to put titles on a veto, they, it starts with CEO, president, owner, and other privileged C-suite executives that veto empowers to get stuff done at Veto Incorporated. So it really is about elevating your level of contact to the person that the sale is ultimately going to go to for approval anyway, this person I call veto. 
And here again, and, and when your audience hears us say the word veto, think about that person with the ultimate veto power who can say yes when everyone says no and no when everyone says yes in the organization and make it stick. So that, that's the person we're talking about. Yeah. Right. And then why, you know, give us some of the main reasons why you think it's important to get to veto first, because really what a lot of salespeople do you know, from what I've seen is they're just happy to talk to the first person that they can speak to in the account. And then they start their sales process from there. But they they never know where they really are in the hierarchy. Why is it so important to get to veto first? Well, let, let's just back up for a second. I, I think the reason salespeople aim too low is because most sales leadership is focused on activity, you know, get more appointments, get more presentations, get more demos, put more quotes out there. And so salespeople naturally, like many of us, although salespeople are pretty unique in a lot of ways, they take the path of least resistance. The path of initial least resistance is call on someone that's easy to get to at first, but then difficult to get away from after you make that initial contact. And so if you look at generally speaking, if you were to say to a sales team, hey, in the next, well, the last 30 days, make a list of all the titles of individuals you made sales calls on. And you look at those titles, you'll find most of those titles are lower in the totem pole or the org chart because of that single reason. They want activity. They want to put out quotes, do presentations. And so they take the easy path initially, but then they get pigeonholed and stuck with those people. Matter of fact, many of those people, because of the stupid question we salespeople ask is like, who besides yourself will be making this decision? Right. <laughs> it's me. The buck stops here and you stop here. So you get pigeonholed with this person, demo after demo, lunch after lunch, freebie after freebie, Dunkin' Donut after Dunkin' Donut, and the sale is stalled. And their sales funnel gets constipated because they just go in in a circle and nothing's closing. So then the sales manager comes down on their head and says, hey, get to the decision maker. Well, now you're like a salmon trying to swim upstream. You know, it's just, it's very difficult once you're pigeonholed with these people. So activity is one thing, but quality prospecting, calling on individuals and organizations that are predisposed to buy from us and have the influence and authority to buy from us is really what selling to Vito is all about. Elevating your level of contact. Yeah. To that person where the sale is eventually going to wind up on their desk or someone's desk who they've empowered to sign off on the deal. Right. Yeah. There's no doubt. Let's go back to the being pigeonholed with who yeah. you call in your book, you yeah. know, the Seymours. What yeah. you said is so true. I've heard it a million times where, People will say, you know, you can't go above my head. I'm the person in control. And they do get pigeonholed. And sometimes they even threaten, you know, to kick the salesperson out of the account if they go over their head. But that person typically doesn't have, in your, as you explained, the influence and the authority to make the ultimate decision anyway. It's going to go up. It's going to go up to the top. It's going to go up to the veto. So a tip here to stop this today to stop it today from happening. So let's say I get a lead from the marketing department. You know, someone attended a webinar, uh, some engineer down on the bowels of the company, the Seymour's down there, attended a webinar for an hour on our product, service, and solution. And I get this lead from marketing. I said, wow, this is a hot lead. Look at this. This person hung in there through the end of the webinar. I've got their email address. I got their phone number. Here's the title, head engineer or software developer, IT manager. Don't call that person. Stop. Take a deep breath. Go online. Find the company. See if the company fits the template of your ideal prospect. Is this really a company that you have sold that industry before, have some social proof for before, go through a little checklist to make sure that this is a viable prospect. Then find out the name of the president, the CEO, the owner, or some other privileged C-suite individual. Don't call the person who attended the webinar. 
pick up the phone and call the CEO, the president, the owner, or other privileged C-suite individual and let them know that someone on their team has attended a webinar to find out and now the blank you fill in is not what they learned about at the webinar, right. not all the whiz, whiz and acronyms and techno babble, but the result of what could happen, the possibilities of taking what they learned and making it work for that C-suite individual in the areas that they are interested in. So this can stop today. And it's very easy to stop. Just don't call that person. Right. Not until you get the green light from Vito. Yeah, and what you refer to in your book is you say, like, there's there's Vito, and then Vito has underneath him, as you refer to in your book, decision makers. And Vito has basically recruited yep. all of those decision makers. And all those decision makers are there to only do one thing, implement what Vito wants done as corporate initiatives. So if you can't get to those C-level people or those decision makers, you're probably, and you're down two or three or four levels, as you talk about in your book, now you're interpreting what Vito really wants. Whereas the decision makers know it, but three or four levels down, it gets watered down, right? right. And these people may want to make an impression on Vito and the decision makers, but they really don't have any power. And that's why they're trying to control you. In my estimation, every time I found somebody that was down below that actually had some political power or influence, they never wanted to control me. They were they were comfortable in their own skin. That's right. And, you know, uh, John and the other, both John's here and the audience, this isn't about forgetting Seymour or forgetting the people that are technically going to qualify your product, service, or solution. It's not about forgetting them. We can't take them out of our sales process. We just have right. to place them in our sales process at the appropriate time. And the appropriate time is after we do the business case with Vito, they understand what we can do and how much it's going to cost. And they give us the green light to start taking these individuals' time and energy and effort to do the technical evaluation. So we're never going to eliminate them. We're just going to put them in the right place in our sales process. Let's yeah. let's talk about a scenario which um, is probably people listening right now are saying, okay, if I have a new opportunity, I um, get a qualified lead. I am not going to call the person that went to the webinar. I'm going to follow the Tony's recommendations. Give us some help when we're in an existing sales cycle now. We have, we're working with decision makers. We haven't yet got to veto. How, give us some advice on how do we utilize the individuals that we're calling on and create a scenario that allows us to get to veto in the mix of being already in a sales campaign and already have been meeting with some decision makers. Could you talk a little bit about that? Like, let's say we find ourselves in a current sales cycle with decision makers. We know we're not to veto. We need to get to veto. What advice would you give us? Yeah, John, this is a good question. So let's, let's separate this into two categories. The first category is you're with the decision maker and they've never told you not to go over their head. Right. They're a true decision. Yeah. I mean, as to the other John's point, these decision makers report directly to Vito. They're like one step lower than Vito. And, you know, they usually have titles like VPs or directors or or other C-suite individuals, a COO, a CSO or someone like that. So if you're with that individual, they know Vito. They're hanging out with Vito. They probably report and talk to Vito every day. So when you're with that, let, let's put that in one category. You're with a decision maker, true decision maker. They got the title of it. It looks like a duck. It walks like a duck. It quacks like a duck. It's a decision maker. And they've not told you ever not to do it. That's one category. The other category is you're with the decision maker, but they said to you, you know what, Tony? It'd really be best if you work with me and only me. So they, they blocked you. So you have two situations, no block and block. So now let's look at the real tough nut here, the block. They say, look, Tony, we'll work it for you. We'll be your coach. I'll be your champion. And, and right when someone says that to me, I'm going to set the expectation of what my champion needs to do for me. 
So there's the first problem with salespeople. We don't ask the champion. We don't direct the champion. We don't inform the champion or the coach of what we need out of that coach. So, so let's just say, okay, so now we're blocked by this coach, this champion, this whoever. So my sales cycle is going on and on. I'm not closing the deal. I'm getting pressure from my leadership to close the deal. I go to this guy or gal that blocked me and I lay it out to them. Look, we've spent the last four months, four demos, 35 factory visits, 21 lunches, whatever. I'm going to add it up. My cost of sales, I'm going to say, look, this is what it's been costing us. We cannot continue to do this. I'm being told by the leadership of my company that we have to make progress towards a close or I can't, I can't do it anymore. I have to stop. Now, salespeople don't know how to do that because they'll lie, they'll cheat, they'll steal time from someone else, pre-sales resources. They don't want to let it go. But let me tell you something. You need to either let it go or move it forward. And you could use your leadership as a great excuse if you need one. I'm getting pressure. I can't do another demo, another factory tour, another freebie until we get a yes or a no on a time frame about when this deal is going to happen. Yeah, oh, good, guy, good guy, bad guy. You got perfect. Good guy, bad guy, good girl, bad girl, bad cop, good cop. Yes. Right, right. You got, and your leadership has to know you're doing this because you could say, look, John and John, if you don't like this, Call my sales leader right now. She's in her office. And so they have to be prepared to back you up on this because it's not airware. It's, it's not an issue. It's the real deal. So that's how you handle the nut that is just hard to crack. You got to call it. That's number one. The can you also, Tony, before moving to the non-blockers, can, um, can you also do it? By not telling them what you're facing or what your scrutiny is or what have you, I'm not dismissing that. I like that strategy. I've also yeah. seen some people do a really good job of asking the blockers questions that they can't answer. Yes, exactly. That's a, an exact extension of that because here, and you know, this is like with the real veto, please stand up. You yeah. have business qualifying questions that you need to be asking right out of the gate. If they can't answer it, you know you're with a veto wannabe. And so, yes. And you say, well, what are these questions? My God, we could brainstorm these questions and salespeople need to have them at the ready, ready to go on the first conversation with the person they think is the decision maker. Yeah. And how many that. times have sales reps been blocked, been told, yeah, and they've been calling on the same customer for you know three months. Yes, you're going to get the deal. Yeah, I put it in. You're going to get the deal. Next thing they, that, that same customer won't return their phone calls for two or three weeks. And guess what? They lost the deal, went someplace else. Why? The competitor was way higher than they were. The competitor knew the real business issues and wasn't really being blocked or pigeonholed, as you called it, Tony, by, by the Seymour. Yeah, that's right. And, and as a salesperson, when that happens to me, I just blame it on politics. And I tell my, my, my salesman, that ah, was politics. We lost it on politics. You didn't lose it on politics. You were asleep at the switch or you didn't know where the switch was. Yeah. Well, yeah. The customer typically would tell them, well, we decided, you know, not to buy, you know, uh, got caught up or we lost the budget. There's always some excuse as to why they, they lost. It's never that they lost to the competition. The customer won't have the the courage typically to tell them that they'll tell them that some other excuse. You know, John, that's, that's an interesting word to use courage. Here's the thing about a veto. When you know you're with veto, when you ask the tough questions and they'll answer them, but there are some questions that are real stupid questions to be asking a veto. And so, and so you have to be aware of this and, and you'll know when you're with veto, when they're not shy about telling you they don't want to answer the question, they can't answer the question. It's too early to answer the question or they'll nail it. Yeah. And, and there's so a, there's a really good saying there, Tony, to just support that, that I learned years ago at Xerox when they told us on how to call higher inside of organizations they said, you have to contemplate the mind of, let's say the mind of a veto. We didn't call it veto back then, but we, I'm sure they do now. But um, the first thing was, don't ask me a question you could have got the answer to from somebody else in my organization. That was number one. Number and number two, one. and I've never forgotten it. Yeah. If it's been in print, 
I expect that you've read it. Those were golden rules for me growing up. And I, I really, I really love how you've kind of translated that into actionable steps. Well, you know, what's interesting on that score, John, if you stop and think about it, here's, here's what's off the table for Vito, totally off the closed ended questions. Yeah. Come on. Salespeople hear this loud and clear. Never, ever, ever use a closed ended question with anybody. I mean, a closed ending question, as you know, you guys know, it's answered with a yes or a no. You got a 50 50 chance of getting the answer you want. Those are bad odds. That's number one. Number two, don't ask premature questions of a veto. Well, gee, Vito, what is your marketing strategy to capture the Pacific Basin for your widgets next year? Come on. You can't, you don't have an, you haven't earned the right to ask that question, right? So how do we do this? Well, the best way to do it, if you're, if you're calling on a veto in a publicly traded company, buy one share of stock in the company, just one share. What does that make you? Stockholder, what do you get in the mail? Everything, managers reports, interim reports, well, you get it all. And so if, if you don't wanna buy one share of stock, then before you pick up the phone and call a veto in a publicly traded company, look at the recent filing of the manager's report, which is gonna tell you how well they're doing against their stated goals in their annual report to their shareholders, a quarterly report. It's done every quarter. So if you look at the manager's report, you'll know how they're doing, how they're not doing, but you don't show up letting Vito know that you looked at their manager's report. You got a hint about it, you know? And so you don't say, well, in your recent filing of your manager's report, I see that you've fallen short on three of your promises to your share. No, you don't do that. You, you, Use skillful questioning, smart questions. And Vito says, well, it's, gee, it sounds like you've looked at our most recent manager's report. And in fact, I did. Yeah. yeah so honey, it's, it's the, you can look in the annual report. You can look in the 10K and the business risk section. You can look at the manager's report. And yes. what I've found a lot of times is you can find CEO initiatives. And if you yeah. want to talk about getting to decision makers, ask around and find out who is in charge of one of those initiatives. You know that that person has been personally assigned by the CEO to get this initiative done and get it done before they have to file the next annual report, right? So if you want to talk about somebody that can be a really strong champion and has the ear of of veto, that's a person to get to. Johnny, I really like what you guys are talking about here. and And the listeners should just really pay attention to this because you guys are talking about stuff that's mission critical to a company. If it's showing up in an annual report, if it's showing up in, um, uh, you know, manager reports, 10 Ks, 10 Qs, whatever they are, if it's showing up, um, then the same logic applies to them where the CEO says, Hey, if it's been in print, I expect that you've, you've read it. I've also used this for the Seymour's to determine whether or not it's really a Seymour. Um, because people with power and influence, they're held accountable and they're measurable to these things. When you ask questions about initiatives and you ask questions about maybe how they're measured on those initiatives, first of all, if they don't really have a great understanding or articulation of, a, of initiative, I think Jeff Foxworthy, like that comedian, would say, there's your sign. <laughs> like that's one of your first signs. And then if they're not measured, Vetoes are always measured. That's and right. if, they're, if you're asking somebody a question about how they're measured or how they're held accountable and they don't have a good answer for it, that's a really, really good sign that you're not with somebody with power and influence. Yes. Now, to that point, and, and just so the listeners understand, so when, when the three of us here say Seymour, we're talking about an individual that's critical um, in, the, in the influence of technical decisions but they always want to see more stuff, see more data sheets, see more presentations, see more freebies, see more loaners. And so they drive us crazy. It's activity, but it's really not the right activity until we have the business case nailed. They're very tactical. They're not strategic. I want to just circle back before we go on to one thing about publicly held companies. They all have boards of directors. And I've had the privilege of sitting on a few boards. And I got to tell you, um, you can get paid handsomely for it, 
You have some nice perks for it. But about 30 days before a board meeting, you start freaking out because you want to get something to take to the board meeting to justify your existence on the board and look like a hero. So think about this. Uh, every veto has a veto. Veto has a board. What would happen? What would happen to your sales process, to your quota, to your commission check? If you looked out in your territory, found every company that's publicly held, that's in your territory, that your product solution, uh, service or solution can help. And instead of calling the president, CEO or owner, you call one or more of the people who sit on the board. And now here's the deal. You, the person picks up the phone and you say, now you're sitting on the board of a company and I see you got a board meeting come up. Would you be willing to take this idea to the next board meeting? And they go, what the hell are you talking about? What idea are you talking about? And now if you lay out your value proposition as to what they can do with your idea to take to the board meeting, you're in. It, it's, it's, it's a lay down. This is a total lay down. And I've taught this. And salespeople will sit there and go, yeah, that's a great idea. You're going to do it? Well, you know, I got to get it. I got to get more appointments. Well, <laughs> Johnny, I'm feeling the listeners. The audience is just puckering up right about now, buddy. <laughs> no, but, but Tony's got a really good point. But if, yeah. you, if you are going to call a board member, even when you call veto, you have to basically take whatever you found or whatever you think the issue is and translate it into yeah. revenue, profitability, efficiency, or risk and compliance, as what Tony outlines in his book. If you can't put it in those terms, then you really sell into somebody other than Vito and the decision makers, because that's what they're they're measured on every quarter. They're measured on those those different. Uh, yes. and, and John, to that point, salespeople get sidetracked very quickly on this issue. Go well. We don't have those numbers. We don't have those metrics. Marketing hasn't given them. Stop. Wait a minute. If you have a client and you're in your book of business, you can get those numbers. Yeah. All you need to do is follow a quote in one of the best selling books of all time. And that quote is ask and thou shalt receive. You can find this out. It's up to the salesperson to understand this and get this information and use it to your point, John, in your pitch to veto. You know, what are you doing for others? See, Vitos have a strong external frame of reference. They want to know what's going on in the world around them. Social proof plays out really well with Vitos. Social proof that's relevant and scalable. What are you doing for others in Vitos industry? Yeah, Very that's a powerful. scaled company in Vitos industry. And across the board, if you're working for a company and they're profitable, you got customers. You can find this stuff out. And so don't turn around and ask marketing to do it for us. Do it for ourselves. Great. And take it to your point, John, and pitch it to Vito. Yep. Let's um, let's Tony, give... I just want to go back, Johnny. Just want to go yep. back to something we touched on earlier. Maybe we'll go deeper in here. But, Tony, when we have gotten to Vito in a number of situations after we you know, took, had your seminar, we went in, you know, got the 10K report, read the business risks section, did the annual report, you know, started Googling all the top executives and decision makers. And then we put together, you know, like three or four concise slides, got into CVDO. And when we talked about their corporate initiatives and strategic or corporate objectives, strategic initiatives, tactical cost benefit issues. I mean, I remember one time I was in the UK and a guy, a customer slammed his fist on the, on the table, said, where the hell did you get that information? <laughs> and we said, it's all public information. But what that did for us is it, it put us at equal stature with that executive team, number one. And then number two, in the eyes of the customer, it put us at a different level than other salespeople. We now had an end that other salespeople simply just didn't have. Yeah, there's a couple of things at play there, John, that are really critical. One, um, you had equal business stature. You, you created it and you established equal business stature. Now, equal business stature does not mean you have the same title as the person you're communicating with. You don't belong to the same country club. You don't have the private jet. You don't have the corporate perks. 
But what you do have is an equal understanding of some, not all, but just some of this CEO or this Vito's problems and a creative idea on how to solve them. That's number one. So you had that equal business stature. And because of that, you then became or started to become a trusted advisor. You had an inside. You were separate. You were, uh, you were above the competition because they tr- they started to trust you initially yeah. because you had information that was spot on. So good for you, man. Good for you. So it's equal business stature and becoming and maintaining that equal business stature and then becoming a trusted advisor. Then when Vito moves from company A to company B, I'm going to take you with them. So, yes, so we're going to yes, go go talk a lot more about strategies and tactics here, but I want to just reach out to the listeners that are, I called it puckering a little bit earlier, and I'm just being sympathetic, like, and I want to give some spirit and some courage, uh, you know, and courage is defined for me as like the men and women of the 101st Airborne that jump out of airplanes, uh, you know, for the military. It's like, everybody's afraid to go, but they go anyways. And that's like, that's the fine line of some of the stuff that we're talking about here is that this is available to everybody. And the only way that you kind of get the courage to do this is you get results from it working well. And so I just want you to listen with an open mind as we continue to go through this. Tony, I heard you talk about on another podcast, I think, or I might have read it, one of your articles about the imposter syndrome. And, And I think it's actually what makes people really, really successful is they, you know, even the most successful people I've ever met, they're, they, they really are humbled in a way. And there's like this imposter syndrome. You're like, I, I don't really deserve to be here, or I don't really deserve all of the, you know, accolades I've gotten or what have you. And I love your story about how it started. Like in your book, you talk about it, you're working for HP and you actually came up with selling to Vito when well, you were on a plan. So you were doing where you killed it your first three years. And then your third year in, somebody comes to you and says, hey, we're putting you on a plan. And then, like, I think people listening to would just be like, you got to be kidding me. And then you came up with this strategy, which is so out there probably for your peers. Like, I'm not going to start down below. I'm going to start at the highest level. And could you talk a little bit about that imposter syndrome and how you kind of cracked the code on that? Yeah, man, I, you've given me full body goosebumps, John, when I when I think back about this, because this was a crazy situation. And, and just to, to the little details here. Yeah, it was year number four. I'm halfway through the year. I'm 19 percent of this plan they put me on. And my yeah. manager says, you're on probation. If you don't hit your number in six months, you're out of here. And I was like, what? I'm a stellar salesperson. Not anymore. You're not. You're 19% of quota. I freaked out. I panicked. I didn't. I started blaming everything. My territory stinks. My products are high priced. That's what HP stood for back then. High price. <laughs> My sales cycle was nine months. And I'm looking at the calendar and I go, oh, geez, I'm in trouble. I got to do something that I've never done before, but I got to get to the person in every manufacturing company in my sales territory, because I had a piece of software for manufacturing, I got to get to the person at the top and I'm going to ask them just three simple questions. And on the, 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 those three simple questions, if they answer them, I'm going to work that and get it. Or if they you know, I'm, I'm running to the next place. And so I started doing this and it was a leap of faith. I, I, I mean, it was crazy. Call a president of a company. The first time I got a president on the line, I hung up on them. I got so nervous. I, 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 <laughs> so, so, yeah, I jumped out of the plane. And, and the biggest leap I took, of course, it wasn't like the first airborne was life or death because none of the stuff I did was, was uh, life-threatening. But part of my getting off probation is I had to sell a system to a college and university because we had a piece of software for registration and student tracking and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. I never went to college. I never got a college education. I took a few college credits, but I didn't have what a dean of schools would have in their office with trophies and plaques and, and, and uh, diplomas and all this kind of stuff. But what did I do? 
I booked an appointment with the dean of schools at a college in my territory. A couple of days before the appointment, I started getting sick. I started getting stomach cramps, cold sick. <laughs> this is crazy. What am I going to say to this person? I know nothing about college curriculum and how a college works. I show up for the appointment. I am sweating. I'm sitting in the dean's office looking up at all these diplomas and all this beautiful artifacts and stuff. I'm getting up ready to bolt out of the door. And who walks in? The dean of schools. He holds his hand out to shake my hand. And I freaked out. I go, I was just getting ready to leave. I don't have a college diploma. I've never been to a college. I don't know any. And he's looking at me like I'm crazy. And he shakes his hand like this. He's, stop it. Stop it. Sit down. Sit down. I sit down and he says, you know what? This morning, I almost had my assistant call you and cancel our meeting. And I looked at him and I said, why? He says, because I don't know anything about computer systems. And I thought, what? Wait a minute. This is a dean of schools that I was freaked out about meeting because I don't know anything about college. He was going to cancel the meeting with me because he knew nothing about computers. And that yeah. cracked the code for me right there. After that, no one was out of reach for me because well, I yeah. had something to talk to them about that maybe they didn't know about. Yeah, that was crazy. Changed my life. <laughs> Changed. I think that's pertinent for any veto if you actually do homework on their organization. Yes. It, it might be the third rule that, uh, of the two that Johnny laid out. <laughs> is that tell them something that they don't know about their business or their industry. And, In a way that they uh, could and they, they want to know more, right? That's re it's really important if you really do your homework, right? Before we jump off that, Johnny, I just want to, Tony, how do you feel about a lot of people ask me questions about agendas? Like there's somebody sitting wondering about an appointment. What the heck are we going to talk about? You're wondering about an appointment. You know, what am I going to talk about? How do you feel about this, you know, the, the preparation of sending a, an agenda and giving people a heads up on what they're going to talk about? Could you comment on that? You better believe it and make it a very interactive email, you know, say, hey, th this is what we can. These are the subjects that are on the table. What do you want to add? What do you want to take off? You got 15 minutes, stick to 15 minutes. You got five minutes, stick to five minutes. You know, uh, don't use the icebreaker that we've been taught to use when you walk in somebody's office. You know, just uh, get down to business, cover the topics to your point, send an agenda ahead of time, even if it's a remote, you know, Zoom meeting or whatever. At the end of the meeting, at the very end of the meeting, this is what I'm going to suggest every sales person does with a veto. End of the first meeting with a veto. If you're in person and you're sitting in the office and you're looking around their office and you see the gold plated you know, golf clubs on the wall or the picture of the beautiful sailboat or whatever artifact there is in your office. Don't mention it. Get down to business five minutes, 10 minutes on the way out the door. Hey, Ms. Importante, the next time we get together, you've got to tell me the story about that gold plated golf club hanging on your wall. And they're going to look at you and say, why wait till then? Let me tell you now. And as you close the meeting, you're going to end it on a high personal note. Every time they look at that golf club, they're going to think of you and the story they told, uh, told you when you were walking out the door. So always end your meeting with a veto. If it's a Zoom meter or whatever, hey, if you don't see anything on the walls, uh, Mr. Benefito, next time we get together, you got to tell me the story about how you started this company, how you became the CEO. Yeah. Leave it, Dude, leave it. this is like that little piece of advice is such gold because people get it so wrong. Yes. Try to go personal first and let's say it works and somebody tells you about the boat or somebody tells about the children. Now you're 15 minutes into your precious agenda and I just see people just they they just mess it up. I love this advice by you. Earn yeah. the right to go personal at the end, which leaves the door open either to continue a conversation or you'll be welcome back. It's such well, great advice. And sometimes, you know, the CEO might tell his assistant. You know, after 15 minutes, come on and open up the door. And then they yes. can give them either a nod, no, continue. But if you're still talking about the gold-plated golf club, he might say, yeah, okay, I got another meeting. Sorry, I got to go. Yeah, really good, man. Really hey, good. Listen, I learned this the hard way. I called on the CEO of a manufacturing company. Guy's name was Rich Wall. 
And and uh, I walk into Rich Wall's office and behind his desk is this enormous picture taken from a helicopter of a racing sailboat leaned way over. And on the side of the sailboat, in rough waters, Wall Street. That's the name of his boat. I'm looking at this. I'm going, oh, this is cool. I know how to sail. Watch this. He comes in. He sits down. He leans in his big chair and says, that racing sailboat, does it have running or fixed uh, running, hydraulically controlled running backstays or fixed backstays? And he launches into this big discussion about his boat and all the races he's been all over the world. And on his desk is this international fishing reel that's a clock. These reels are about $2,000 a piece. He's got one as a clock. And the clock is ticking and he's telling me about this story. To your point, 10 minutes, gets up, <laughs> I got to leave. He runs out the door and I'm sitting there, John, looking at the sailboat. Looking I've at been the there, dude. Okay, so here's, listen to this. This is what happened. I had an opportunity to sell two, not one, but two HP 3000s to this company, right? Didn't happen. They bought HP, but they bought it from one of our distributors. Mm. I didn't get a penny on the commission. That's not the rub of the story. They took their IBM system and donated it to the college I was calling on to buy oh. the system. <laughs> oh, God. Wow. That's how I learned that trick. Yeah. 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 Now, Tony, when a lot of salespeople finally get like in a meeting with Vito or going to send a letter to Vito, they usually do what I say is they speak the wrong language. They're not, they're not, even if they're prepared, they think they're prepared, but they're starting to talk about features and functions and technology and a bunch of that stuff that Vito really doesn't care about. Can you talk a little bit about? speak in the right language and how to correspond with, with Vito. Yeah, so, so very quickly, there's really four languages we salespeople need to be proficient at. First one is Vito's language, that's benefits. The definition of a benefit in the book of Vito is the result, the measurable result your product, service, and solution can deliver, either through proof or suspect or estimate, in the four areas that you mentioned before, revenue generation, cost control, efficiencies and effectiveness, and risk mitigation. There it is right there, that's a benefit. The result, one level down, if you're ever asked by a veto, how do you do that? How do you get me that kind of ROI for that kind of investment? Your answer is using the language of advantages. The definition of an advantage in the book of Vito is how you tailor, customize, or modify whatever you sell to do whatever it is you said the benefit could do. So it's the due diligence you go through, the, the, the research you have to conduct, the, the, the process in which you um, uh, customize and tailor whatever you sell to do what it is that you just told Vito you were doing. Now, that's usually all you need to know with Vito. Benefit advantage, benefit advantage, bah, benefit advantage, benefit advantage. Not the old school fab feature advantage benefit does, does not fly for a veto. And here's why. Since you mentioned feature, you're going, you're going out of the office and you're going down a couple levels because now you don't sound like veto. You That's sound right. like somebody three levels down. And you're, you get, you're preaching, you get you're relegated, you know, to who you sound like. And you're going to be sent to the person you sound the most like. And it's going to happen in an eye blink. Facts, features, functions. You drop one of them, one silly acronym or product name or number or buzzword, you're done. One word, one word that Vito doesn't care about, you're done. And, and it happens. And it's happened to all of us. In a conversation, we dropped an F-bomb, a fact, feature, or function that was unfamiliar to Vito. And they go, you know what? Hold on. Let me get somebody who, to that point about the, <laughs> the secretary comes in and looks in and Vito goes, get this guy out of here. Yeah. Hang up the phone. Boom. Dial tone. You're done. So the, the third language is features and the fourth language is functions. You don't mix those up. Benefit, advantage, benefit, advantage for Vito. Feature, function, feature, function, down in linoleumville with Seymour. Don't mix these up. <laughs> this right here, this, this split, this is the Italian salad dressing of sales training. 
You mix it oil and vinegar. Mix it up all you want. As soon as you stop mixing it, what do you got? Oil and vinegar separates. Don't mix this stuff up. Don't start talking benefits and advantages down in linoleum building. You, know, you stop trying to sell me and just stick to the facts. So it, it, you got to separate these. Whether you're writing it, saying it, putting it in a PowerPoint presentation, it's got to be benefit, advantage. And the only time you use an advantage, if you're asked the question, how do you do that? Then you use an advantage. It's right. very One time, Johnny and I used to sell CAD systems, computer-aided design, and yeah. in most of the big accounts, there was a CAD director. Yeah. So when we got up way high to the CEO or the VP, we used to tell the salespeople, if you even chirp, the acronym CAD, we're going to get thrown out of here and we're going to get yeah. relegated to the CAD director. Yeah. Yeah. Or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. I always tell salespeople to take a rubber band, a big fat rubber band, like you get on broccoli and asparagus and put it around your wrist. When you're making calls to Vito, if you drop an F word, just take the rubber band out about four inches and let it go. And after a couple of those, you'll finally get it that you're not supposed to be using F bombs with Vito. Yeah. So guys, we've established that, you know, getting the veto and how important it is. The reality is the way deals get done, especially today, where the way people acquire and acquire for use and collaborative sale and, 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 and collaborative decision making, I want to talk about the reality of what I call M and W. So I can tell on sales campaigns in M, it means you started lower and you moved up, you came back down, you moved up, you came back. So it's a series of interactions. And I look for, I look for either M's or W's. I don't like you, Tony would probably encourage us to go for the W where we start up in the top. We earn the right. We get the hall pass. We move back down through the organization. We're going to be welcome back. So I just want the listeners to understand that is it's your if you're not doing an M or a W, you're 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 really not you're really not going to be successful. And and Tony's uh, advice to us is really try to do the W first to get the hall pass. Let's talk about that. We have a successful conversation with Vito. We get the hall pass. Yes. Can you tell us the protocol? Yes, of how to dude. operate in the W and how to, you know, how do we get the hall pass? How do we make sure we're welcome back? Which I know you wrote a book about. And, and this, I love this. You got to write a sales book about the M and the W. Dude, you're going to teach me. You've written 17 of them. You're going to teach me how to write just one. McMahon <laughs> wrote a great one. It's called The Qualified Sales Leader. It's an unbelievable book. This, this is classic. It's absolutely classic. So, so yeah, you know, um, here, here's, okay, here's what you never want to do with a veto. Don't ever do this. Your first meeting with a veto, either on the phone or in person. Salespeople have this stupid habit of saying to somebody, well, gee, Vito, you want me to keep you informed as I move through the organization and get back? Vetoes know everything. Don't ever say to a veto, did you know, or do you want to know, or let me explain. No, 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 no. Listen, don't do it. Don't ask it. Just do it. And the way you do it is, is veto in that first meeting, you're going to find out who veto wants you to work with, right? This is yeah. classic. Veto say, look, I want you to call my chief sales officer because she's driving this initiative, right? So now, don't say to Vito, well, gee, Vito, would you call your chief sales officer and let her know? No, don't do that. Vito doesn't work for you. <laughs> Vito works for the company that they created. So now I'm, I'm just going to fast forward and then I'll come back to it, but be patient with me. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to pick up the phone as I'm a, on the way to my car. I'm going to call the chief sales officer and I'm going to, if I get into their voicemail, I just use two words right out of the gate. Your CEO, Vito Benefito or Ms. Importante, suggested that we should chat, right? Now, any CSO or any direct report of Vito that wants to keep their job 
will never not call you because you said the CEO said that maybe we should chat. And so this is another one of these things that just the lay down, you're going to have people calling you back, which is, wow, somebody really called me back from a voicemail message. It will start leaving really smart voicemail messages and they'll do it. So now I've, and maybe Vito said, well, I want you to talk to these three people. It's the same message. Your CEO in a meeting just five minutes ago, wants us to have a chat, call me. Here's a good time to reach me. And you let them know a good time to meet you. You never say to Vito, hey, you want me to keep you informed? You just do it. And you do it in a way of an email or whatever way they like to be communicated with, which is another question. You know, what's the best best way to me circle back to you? You know, you could say it that way to Vito or just do it. Do it in a number of different ways, voicemail, email. Okay, so now you're on your way. But before you go on your way, you have to find out if Vito has the money in a certain period of time to spend with you. So now I hear salespeople, well, oh, it's too early. I don't know how much it's really going to cost. Come on, you know about what it's going to cost. So here's the question to Vito. Vito, if we could do what we're talking about doing here, and we could nail it somewhere between a half a million and a million dollars, right? Do you have that kind of money to spend with me and my organization between now and the end of this month, the end of the quarter, the end of the year, whatever? That's the question. And I was using that question back when I was on probation, because that, if you do it in seven months, I, I'm not going to be here. <laughs> Right. And so you have it. And will you spend it in the next six months? Now, just shut up if you ask that. And don't say something like, well, you know, we do have a discount program coming up. And if you wait till the fourth quarter, this stupid stuff, you got to stop. Just say half a million to a million. Do you have it or not? And would you spend it with me or not? Now, Vito is going to look up at the ceiling tiles and they're not going to say, yeah, let me write the check now. Why wait till then? They're not going to say that. They're probably going to say something like, well, We'll see. Oh, next question. What do you need to see? <laughs> you just said, we'll see. What do you need to see? What do you need to feel? What do you need to experience? What do you need to have to make that decision? So question everything and using a smart conversational questioning style. So you say to Vito, do you have that kind of money? Uh, but before you ask that question, and Vito says to you, okay, go work with my CSO. If she likes it, we're on track. Okay, before I ask the money question, I ask this question, Vito, what are your personal expectations mm -hmm. of me and my company? All right, this stuff right there. And don't okay. say well, you like the fact that we have this. You know, what are your personal expectations? You gotta use the word personal. And whatever Vito says, you write down. And if they're talking too fast, you say, whoa, 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 whoa. What was that word you just used here? I want to make sure I got it right. I'm writing this all down. Because what they're telling you is how high you have to jump up on their yards yeah. to get yeah. their business. Now Vito gives you the personal expectations. And they're not shy. If they won't answer the question, they're not Vito. They'll say, here's what you're going to hear. Well, that's a darn good question. Here's what I look for. One, two, three, four, five. And you got them all, you write it down. Then, then they say, okay, now look, I got to run. Go talk to my CSO, jump through all the hoops with her. And you go, wait a minute, not done. If we can exceed those four personal expectations and solve the problem with your CSO, could you see yourself spending between a half a million and a million bucks with me and my company between now and the end of some period of time? You got to ask that question. When you ask that question, you're going to get a job offer from Vito. Vito's going to say, you're looking for a sales job? I want my salespeople doing this yeah. before they go running down anywhere. So you qualify Vito. That's how this works. So, Tony, what you what you just highlighted, which I really love, and, and Johnny, I'm sure you see this today, um, it's as much about how you sell today yes. as it is about what you sell. That's what we're finding with like tech. Now our audience is, you know, a, a lot of technology people and, and um, you know, there's great technical differentiation out there, but at the end of the day, what we're really finding right now, which is a huge advantage is how people sell 
can be just as much of a differentiator versus what you sell. So um, you're giving just great tips, dude. Amen, brother and sister. So here's here's the fact of the matter. And it's always been this way since the beginning of time. You sell yourself first, then you sell your company. And guess what? Vitos don't really care who you work for until they understand what you can do for them. And yeah. you're the conduit. You're that conduit, man. And to your point, it is about the seller, the salesperson, their style, their questioning ability. They're taking notes. They're listening. There's soft skills is critical today. And, and we lack in them. We lack in the understanding of how to listen to someone. We lack in questioning a word that they use that's unfamiliar to us. We're, we're like, oh, I shouldn't ask that question. I'll sound dumb. No way. Vito uses a, a, a word like, hey, our sales process is fragmented. Oh, fragmented? Tell me what you mean by that. How does that apply to your sales process? Never heard that word used before when it comes to a sales process. Question stuff that you hear. Take notes. Be interested not interesting. Dude, that's so good. That's so good. Yeah, that's so good. Okay, Tony, so now here's a pet peeve of mine. When people finally get the opportunity, they've spoken to Vito, they've worked with the CSO or whoever the, the delegate is as one of the decision makers, they've done all their homework, they're going to come back and they're going to present basically the results, the benefits, the, you know, the cost analysis. They get in front of the CEO and they have 25 slides, each with what I call power story, not PowerPoint. They have like <laughs> paragraphs on every one of them. And Death when they by them PowerPoint. Up, I don't want to read them, and I'm sure a CEO doesn't want to read them. Yep. Can you give people, yep. as I read in your book, Tony's rules for presenting to Vito? Yep. Here's the deal. And this here, I'll, I'll just point back to my own personal expectations here. I had the president of the Robertson company in for a demo when I was at HP. He brought his IT supervisor and a couple of other people. My manager was there. The regional manager was there. We had 78 slides that we're supposed to show people. And back then, back then, look at this. I'll tell you how this was back in, the, in, in 1979. We had a carousel on a slide projector. Oh, my God. So I load the carousel. I get up there. I push it. And what is it, though? It goes backwards. <laughs> backwards. <laughs> Last slide of the 78 was how we can do whatever we say we can do. So I'm looking at this last slide, and I just started talking to it. I said, well, these are the results that after we went. Blah, 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 blah. Great luck. President of the Robertson Company stands up. Stands up and he looks at his people. He says, get this done. And he walks out the door. <laughs> he walks out the door. And so we sit down. Now it becomes this, you know, just a big uh, planning session about blah, 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 blah. And they leave. They leave. My manager calls me in the office and says, you will never do this again. You will have to. You were obligated. To, Wait a minute. What are you talking about? I, the, the president said, get it done. He says, I don't care what the, you will do all 70. It's like 30 days later, I get the purchase order. 30 days. I walk into my manager's office and I take the purchase offer and I hit and it just flew perfectly. It swirled around his office and stopped right on his big desk bladder and, and, and blotter. And, I, and I, I, I pointed to it and I says, that's the last slide. And I walked out. Amen. And from that day forward, I followed this rule. Here's the deal. You got three slides. If you can't say it in three slides, they're not going to listen to it. I'm talking about a veto now. I'm not talking about technologists here. Vetoes, three slides. Each slide, less than 10 words. And don't talk for 30, more than 30 seconds on each slide. That's the rule. First slide, the possibilities, the results and the ROI. You know, what can you possibly do? What do you suspect what you can do? Or what have you proven to do in Vito's industry? And back to the points that, John, you made before, revenue, cost, efficiency, risk mitigation. Right there, that's slide number one. Slide number two, what is needed to do it? Resources on the customer side and on your side. 
And the last slide, your social proof and your guarantee. That's it. You're done. Yeah. Just- and for people like social proof, you know, really what you're speaking about, uh, Tony, is, you know, customer, what some people refer to as customer success stories with before and after met- metrics of yeah. other companies in similar industries that are doing or already have done and implemented the solution. So that veto can expect similar type results, right? Similar or greater and never, ever, ever show the names of these companies, especially if they're a competitor. So yes, using relative ranking name drops, which I love, three of the top five banks in the world rely upon us. Five of top 10 hospitals trust us too. So relative ranking, and then if Vito says, well, who are they? You better be prepared to say, well, it's Bank of America, Wells Fargo. Oh, those, you know, hey, you ask, you know. <laughs> so, so never use the name, always use relative ranking. And to your point, relative and scalable in the similar or the same industry and of the same size. Yeah. Yeah, and hopefully of the same use, same exact use case that you're trying to sell to Vito. Yeah. Similar, yes, right. exactly. Johnny, you got to bring us. You got to bring us close to the dock, dude. I'm like running out of my capacity for the cap recap, and you got right, well, to help got, me, dude. I got one more that I really was really curious about when I, you know, reread Tony's book again this weekend. Is thank what you. Was shocking to me, Tony, is that you said in your book that about seventy percent of companies you've worked with either had no clearly defined selling process or had a sales process mapped out, but didn't follow it. And I think, I didn't know it was 70%, but I've always thought it's kind of close to 50 anyway. So can you want to talk a little bit about that and also why it's so important to have a sales process? Yes, John, I would love to do a whole hour on sales process. It deserves it because it is critical. I mean, If you just stop for a moment, salespeople, just stop for a moment and get a piece of paper and just for a moment, write down the different pieces of your sales process. Don't put them in any order. Just like, okay, we've got to do a demo. Wait, no, 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 wait. We got to send out a letter. Yeah, we got to engage. We got to do a a discovery and an assessment. And then we do a demo and then we do a quote and then write it all down, just the pieces. Put them on different pieces of paper. All right. I got nine different pieces. Well, now put them in order in the order in which you have to do it. But interestingly enough, it's not the same for every industry. Not every industry buys the same. Not every customer buys the same. And so your sales process has to be well defined, but fluid so you could move stuff around and move it around very quickly. Here's an example. As I examine sales processes, to your point, if they even have them, they introduce their terms and conditions at the very end of the sales process. Now, wait a minute. When the legal department gets a hold of terms and conditions, that's called, that's called an opportunity for the lawyers to just tear it apart and start taking precious time after the competition's been in there, all these. So you take the terms and conditions, and that goes in the very first sales call with Vito. As you're ending the conversation, as you're walking out the door, say the next time you do that, but oh, wait, one one thing before that, before the golf club story, hey, here's our terms and conditions. Take a look at them. I've taken a moment to highlight everything in red that we don't change. We don't change. Stuff in yellow, we got some wiggle room. Pass it by your lawyers now because we don't want to slow us down when you really want to buy from us. And so do that up front. There's a lot of things you can move around in your sales process to accelerate your sales process. Yeah, most companies I work with, yeah, we created a sales process five years ago. Are you using it today? Well, some people do it. Some, well, so you don't have a sales process. Right. Don't say you did it five years ago. Nobody's using it. So you need a process, a well-defined process. You could monitor it, change it, and live with it. And no I've, one I've always something. wondered how they gain consistency or how they really scale the company really fast if, and, and speak the same language as if they're moving people around to different cities and different countries. If you don't really have the same terminology, the same sales type of sales process, even if you're changing. 
So yeah. I've always been curious about that. Hi, and just putting in the ingredients anytime you want. You're going to wind up with a hockey puck uh, coming out of the oven than an apple pie. And so what do you expect? The sales process is the same thing. Yeah, and I, I think the, the, the most elite companies that I see on this topic now are the ones that design their sales process after first contemplating how their customer actually buys, what their customer goes through. Then you map the sales process to it. And like Tony, what I love what you said is you look for those critical uh, hurdles, those critical, typical negotiation challenges, and you move them up earlier. Yes. I think the most yeah. elite sales forces in the world do those two things, outside in approach and move those negotiation hurdles up earlier yes. to have a conversation with people. Like you said, have a conversation with people in procurement or legal before there's a deal on the table, you yes. get advice. You go late, you get critiqued. And that, yes. that's some big time... Well, how many times have you been in a forecast session and the rep tells you, I've just been told we won the deal. There's four weeks to go in the before yeah. the end of the quarter. Then you say, well, what is their paper process or internal signature approval process? Right. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> and then Nightmare. when they do do their homework, you find out it's six to eight weeks and you only have four weeks left because you've never been through those types of things up front or in parallel. That in parallel, there you go. You ride ride two horses in the race. That's right. Do it in you know in, in parallel. That's perfect. Yeah, but do it. It's it's amazing too that um, that the process doesn't reflect John the other John's point about how people buy. It yeah. needs to reflect how your prospects and customers buy. That's why one size doesn't fit all. But you yeah. need to have them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so Johnny, the like. Um, we, we, I don't even know if we're even halfway through our notes on what we wanted to talk to Tony about. We've we say this to have, we've only scraped the tip I know of the it. with Tony, so we almost, if he's good, you're coming we, back, dude. Point, we have to get we have you got to come back. back. We're we either got to make this podcast longer, or we just got to tell our guests we're booking them for, for A and B. You know, when we come back for B, I would like to get into the actual opening statements you use to veto over the phone yeah. uh, to get break the preoccupation and get the conversation going. I'd love to cover that. I'd love to cover voicemail messages and email correspondence and LinkedIn stuff. So let's let's do the tactical part in part two. What do you say to Vito when you pick up the phone? I'm and sure every everybody up. wants to hear that, Tony. Everyone wants to hear yeah. that. Well, so we'd we love to have you back. Be fun to Rachel, our producers listening, Rachel, just get Tony, get Tony on the line and get get player B signed up. We need to have the second one signed up because you're right, Johnny. I think that's a, I think that's an absolute must. Johnny, uh, you want to do a little summary? And I'm then, going to. Um, yeah, I'm going to try, man. Some, there were so many golden button. nuggets flying around. I'm going to try and do my best. You know, we we started off with Tony kind of helping us understand kind of why we wound up where we wound up with this hesitation of going to veto or what have you. And I loved what you said, like with all the focus on activity, um, you know, people took the path of least resistance. And I remember being in this situation, it's easier to fulfill activity numbers if nobody's talking to me about quality of activity. So managers out there, I really want you to listen to what we've talked about today. You need to help your reps with the quality of the activities. And for, to be a manager, Johnny, I've always found it a critical, a critical capability of a manager is you've got to be able to help people get to higher levels inside of an organization. So if you're a leader listening to this, play it again, play it over and over and over again. And, um, and on that note, Johnny, I've always thought when they do get to veto, you have, I, I've always proposed that you have to be in the room as the leader. You have yeah. to get there and help. Yeah. Them. Help coach a sales rep that's just in there for the first time. You yeah. have to get in there. Yeah, and and we talked. I agree with that 100, percent Johnny. And we talked about some of the difficulty that we. It's a self fulfilling prophecy. We we wind up with people lower in an organization, and then we find it difficult to get away from them. And um and and so it, there's a whole nother conversation I want to have with you of instead of focusing on getting away from people, how do we utilize those people to help us get to 
the next level. We talked a little bit about that, but, but um, Tony, and also on that, what they do when they can't go, go when the person says you can't go above me, what they have a tendency to do if it's like a tree is they get away and they go out to the further out branches to yeah. the twigs to the end and they end up at a leaf or something. They figure out there's nothing out here either. There's so nothing sturdy to, to hang on to out and there. Then they try to go back over the person's head again and they just get blocked again. Yeah. I love the um, I love the the advice, the tip that you said that when you get a lead, don't just call, call that lead somebody that you know attended a webinar, read a white paper, or what have you. You know, do a little research, call a C-suite individual, and let them know that somebody attended a webinar, and then be ready to talk about what were some of the positive business outcomes that were talked about or that are possibilities, and then some proof points, some relevant proof points. I, I really found that courageous, and I think it's really, really good advice. Um, it's not about forgetting about the decision makers. Now, I want to make sure we're clear with decision makers, because Johnny and I talk a lot about a system called Medic and MedPick, and we have, you know, decision makers and language. I just want to make, these are people, when you say decision makers, these are people that are typically involved in decisions. There are influencers in decisions, and they are, uh, they are, you know, in line with, with the veto. So we didn't want to make people say, somebody identifies as a decision maker and we go away from them. It's like just making sure that we're on the same language there. You talked about blockers um, and you talked about, um, uh, you know, they, they tell you, or you said asking them questions and telling them what they, what you need from them as a champion. And then many times we talked about people will self-select out and say, well, I'm not that person. Well, we need you to do this. And they'll say, well, I'm not going to do this or I can't do this. And it's very, it's just human nature. It's human behavior. They wind up wolfing up a name of somebody else when they come to their own conclusion that that's the process that they're going to be in. Um, don't ask questions that you could have asked. Don't ask questions that you could have gotten the answer to from somebody else in my organization. And if it's been in print, I expect that you've read it. Um, you also said that Seymours are not bad people. They're just typically need to see more. And that's why you came up with the name Seymour. They just typically need to see more stuff. Loved your point about owning proof points. You said you don't want to hear any excuse department about we need more proof points. We need marketing to do this or X, Y, Z. You said if you have an existing customer, these proof points are available and you just got to own it. Um, yeah. You said it's the oldest first, it, you know, you talked about it's the oldest line in, 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 in the greatest book ever written, which is ask and you shall receive. I love that. Johnny and you talked about this equal business stature. I want people to write that down on a piece of paper because I love it so much. It is the confidence and conviction that you get what you're striving to do is you're striving to get on equal business stature. You're not striving to get on title, equal title, equal anything else equal than just business value. And it's, I think that was a really, really good golden nugget. I loved your advice. Dude, there's so many of them. Ending the meeting by getting personal. Don't start the meeting by getting personal. Earn the right to get personal and then end the meeting with getting personal. And it gives you an avenue of either to continue to talk or to come back and talk at another time about how they became a veto or what have you. I thought that was so worthy of just being written down. It was so good. You talked about the different languages, veto languages of benefits, measurable results. You talked about advantages and how do you get those results? And then you talked about the F-bombs, avoid the F-bombs with vetoes because you're going to get delegated to people that speak these F-bombs on facts, on features, and functions are typically those people that report to vetoes that are going to need to understand that. And vetoes have those people in their organizations that they rely on for that information. And then Johnny so eloqu eloquently said, you get delegated to those that you sound like. I think everybody should write that down. You get delegated to those that you sound like. How do you stay engaged with the veto? Uh, not do 
Uh, not do you want, how do you want me to keep you informed? This is also such good language. Not how would you like me to keep you informed, but what's the best way for me to, um, to stay engaged with you? What is your personal expectation of me and my company? I thought that those were such golden wow, nuggets. So strong. I loved how you talked about asking about the money. Fido's expect you to ask about the money. I have a saying in my head that says, if you haven't had a conversation about how much, how soon, and how sure, then you're really not talking to a veto about anything that's 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 uh, really in, that's really important. Perfect. Um, yeah. So the, you talked about um, asking the question about the money, which said, "Do you have the money X Y Z dollars in the next six months or whatever?" And just having the confidence and conviction because vetoes expect you to talk about that and they expect you to be audible ready with this. I want to say something to our listeners that I wrote down. It's really important to me. We didn't talk about it here, but I, you know, we got John McMahon, one of the greatest sales leaders on the planet. We got Tony on the line and Perinello. I, I'm, I'm going to butcher your last name. I'm sorry. I called Tony Vito is who I really know you as who has unbelievable knowledge. You got Kaplan that's spitting out some nuggets here. <clears throat> Everybody listening. I want you to write this down. Listen to the content that we've talked about today. Don't try to replicate anybody's style. Don't try to say it the way Tony's saying it, the way McMahon's saying it, the way Kaplan's saying it. You'll figure out how you say something will be your style. But don't confuse content and style. The content that we shared today was really, really powerful. And how you sell is just as important as what you sell. Love this last gold nugget here. I don't know if it's the last one. I got so many here, Johnny McMahon. This one here was so good. And we we kind of blew over it. Be interested versus trying to be interesting. Be interested versus trying to be interesting. Think about the last dinner party you went to. Think about, and you, you, there's a difference between people you talk to, the people that are focusing on being interested versus the people that are trying to be interesting to you. And it's such a great thing to write down. And it's just basic human nature and conversations. Tony's rules for presenting, and Johnny, I'm going to wrap it up here. Tony's rules for presenting to veto. Three slides. If you can't say it in three slides, you're not ready to meet with veto on a presentation. Three slides, less than 10 words, 30 seconds on each slide. The first slide should be about the possibilities focusing on revenue, cost reduction, and mitigation of risk. Second slide should focus on <clears throat> what is needed or required to get us there. And the third slide should focus on what you called social proof, which our audience knows is like proof points, case studies, testimonials. Um, that was golden. Dude, what did I miss? Johnny McMahon, what did I miss? Well, there's so many golden nuggets, but one that I think is really important is uh, Tony pointed out, you know, especially when you were talking about um, not, you know, acting interested, or, but listening. Yeah, You won't really have to know what to say or what to ask if you're truly listening. If you listen to what Vito says and you're reflecting on some of the words that they're using to Tony's point, you can be you. You don't have to be Tony or me or you. Yeah, Just amen. listen, open those ears up and stop thinking about anything else but what that veto is saying to you. And you'll know exactly what to say or what to ask. Great advice, dude. Rapid fire, Johnny, and bring us home. Tony, you ready for some rapid fire questions? Yeah, why not? All right. How about your ideal day off of work? Oh, that's easy. Surfing, fishing, being down at the beach. And now, uh, okay, so I'm going to get personal now. What about the sailboats behind you? What about the what? What about the sailboats behind you? The, no the, sailing? Uh, yeah, that's, that's an old pond yacht. When I was a kid, my dad used to take me to Central Park, and, and we used to have these pond yachts, these little models. We'd roll up our pants and take a little bamboo stick and hit it, and then run around all the way around the other side of the lake and catch it and hit it back again and watch this little pond yacht sail. So I have a little collection of pond yachts. Brings me back to my childhood. Awesome. <laughs> I thought from that conversation when you were talking about 
the different types of sailboats with the veto that maybe you were really into sailboats yourself. Okay. No, I do. I do love sailing and I love boating, but I do not own a sailboat. <laughs> okay. How about your favorite meal, Tony? A pasta. I speak. Come on, dude. dude. You got to, you're Italian. You got to give us more than that. What kind? Yeah, give us, give us the deets. Puntanesca sauce and some good. Puntanesca. <laughs> yes. Nice. Well done. Love the olives in there, right? Oh, my God, yes. Yes. How about your favorite movie, Tony? It's a mad, mad, mad world. Great one, dude. <laughs> I haven't heard that one. That's a great. That's going way back, too, bud. That is. That is. <laughs> yeah, let's not go there. How about your best concert you've ever been to, Tony? Best concert? Eagles. Whoa, that's a Recently? popular one. Last time they were all together. Yeah. 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 When Glenn Fry was still there or, or, or more recent? Yep. Glenn Fry, yeah. Yep. Tony, you want to talk about um, maybe a favorite charity you might have? Oh, my. That's a good question. Any, um, anything to help children? Anything to, and that's like Shriners or, or St. Jude's or something like that. Yeah. Anything to support the elderly? Uh, veterans and animals in, in that order? Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Well, Tony, I want to say um, thank you so much for agreeing to be a guest, our guest today on the podcast. Uh, to John's point, there's so many golden nuggets. I don't think we could have wrote them all down. And we'd love to have you back again because we could go deeper on a lot of the tactical issues that I think yeah. The audience would be dying to hear from you, Vaughn. So yeah. thank you so much. We're really grateful. Really appreciate it, Tony. You're very, very welcome. And both of you did an excellent job. You're great listeners. The questions you asked, the conversation, the way you guided it. I've done a lot of interviews and I've interviewed a lot of people and you guys did a superb job. Thank you so much for having me. You're awesome, Tony. Thank you for your time. You your in in your continued success for our listeners uh we talked about the book selling devito but there's many many books you know just google tony and 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 i would uh, you know i personally would start with selling devito because that was one of the that's how i started and and then there's wonderful follow-on books from there and and we're gonna have you back we thank you so much for your time your your uh your nug i knew i was going to be challenged in the recap with all the golden nuggets and uh I just can't thank you enough for, for spending time with us. Fantastic. You're very, very welcome. You're very, you're welcome. the man. And for all of you listening, thank you for listening to revenue builders. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Be sure to check us out at forcemanagement.com. management.com.